Да. Окей. Okay. Така ми е само мило, нормално да си на пола главе неки да го поличи. Ага. Добро. Um, so, professor, can we start? Whenever you're ready. Sure. Okay, thank you. Perfect. So, uh, officially, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to Professor Tabanaha, since in St. Louis is currently 10 uh, in the morning. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the second Belgrade Legal Theory Group meeting uh, in this academic year. And it is my great pleasure to say that our today's speaker is Professor Brian Tamanaha. Topic of today's lecture will be Sociological Approaches to Theories of Law, which is the title of his last book, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2022. My name is Mila Djordjevic, and I am a PhD student at Faculty of Law, University of Belgrade, and I'm assistant uh, on the subject Sociology of Law. And as you can guess, uh, my primary topic of interest is Sociology of Law, so it is my great honor to be moderator of this meeting, especially because I was reading Professor Tamanaha's work uh, since very, very early stage in my PhD studies. Uh, before giving a floor to Professor Tamanaha, I will first shortly introduce him, besides the fact that probably the introduction is not really necessary. So, uh, Brian Tamanaha is renewed jurisprudence and law and society scholar, and he is author of 10 books and over 75 articles and book chapters. Some of the titles of his books are A General Jurisprudence of Law and Society, published by Oxford in 2001, then On the Rule of Law, published by Cambridge in 2004, uh, A Realistic Theory of Law, uh, published by Cambridge, and which is the book that won an IVR book prize in 2019. Uh, he, and some of the last books are Legal Pluralism Explained, History, Theory and Consequences, and the topics of today's presentation, Sociological Approaches to Theories of Law. Uh, also, I would mention that in 2013, a national jurist poll of over 300 law deans and professors voted Professor Tamanaha for most influential legal educator. And the fact uh, which we found really interesting is that twice in um, twice uh, in his life, he was voted as uh, Professor of the Year by his students. Uh, and one last uh, quick information from my side, we will have um, one hour lecture, which is uh, usually done by 30 minutes lecture, but today we'll have one hour lecture and we'll have 30 minutes discussion afterwards. So, Professor Tamanaha, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mila, for that generous introduction. Also, thank you for inviting me to participate in your speaker series. I'm really honored, uh, especially honored because I'm following one of my old friends and an extraordinary jurisprudence scholar, and that is Brian Bix. And I gather from what you said, Jerry Postema is coming next. Is that right? Or he's coming up. So I'm, I'm really, really honored by this company. Uh, let me say, I, the, although the most recent book I published was Sociological Approaches to Law. I'm not actually planning to talk about that book specifically, um, but instead I'm going to do something that I think is more useful. First of all, the book is relatively brief and easy to read. Uh, what I'm going to do is just give you a, jack, a general background uh, view of my perspective, the theoretical perspective that, that I bring to bear, and then talk about the implications of it. So much of what I talk about will overlap with what I talk about in that book, but it won't be set forth uh, specifically in the order or relationship set forth in that book. I will say something specifically for those of you who haven't read it, that the primary, uh, at least the first half of the book, is really about separating out laws of social artifact from laws of social construction and talking about how these have different meanings and that jurisprudence scholars have not attended to the differences between them, and in particular, much of the analysis is critical of the view of law as a social artifact, saying that it's too narrow. 
whereas laws of social construction is a much broader encompassing view in which law can be better understood. So that's the uh, that's the book itself. Now I'm not going to talk about the book at all, although I will be very happy to answer any questions from the book or about the book for anyone interested in it. So let me step back now and say that the theoretical approach I apply in my own work uh, was really inspired by philosophical pragmatism. This was a philosophy of law developed at the turn of the 20th century in America. The primary theorists were uh, Charles Sander Peirce, William James, James Dewey, and someone I also use a lot from his sociological angle, and that's uh, George Herbert Mead. So the focus of pragmatism, and there are lots of disagreements and debates about what it means, and I try to sort of keep a core common element through my work, but the core focus of pragmatism is that the theory focuses on what law does, what law is used for, what people think of law, how they act in relation to law, and what the social consequences of law are. It portrays law as a complex of institutions that evolve over time in connection with surrounding social, cultural, economic, political, technological, and ecological factors. So that's the basic idea. The pragmatic approach or the pragmatist approach looks at concrete experiences, concrete consequences, and sees law as something that evolves over time. So what I'm gonna do in the lecture is, and I hope to not run an hour, I'm kind of thinking 45 minutes or 50 minutes, because I know it's hard to listen for an hour, so I'm going to set out the epistemological underpinnings of pragmatism, again, just core ideas about truth and knowledge, and then ontological and methodological aspects of a theory of law informed by pragmatism. In other words, what does that theory lead to if you apply its uh, perspective? The topics that I plan to cover are in order pragmatism, naturalism, historicism, and holism, social construction of law, and if I have time, I'm going to quickly say a few words about instrumentalism, power, and ideals. So first, let's talk about pragmatism. So I mentioned the primary pragmatist theorists. Um, they were, and it's important to understand their background and what influenced them. They were significantly influenced by Darwinian evolutionary theory, the idea that things evolve, everything within society is evolving. Also views of probabilistic explanation, also influenced by the scientific model of inquiry and experimentation, which importantly, the pragmatists viewed as continuous with all forms of human inquiry. In other words, it wasn't something special that set it apart. Uh, so their idea basically, or their perspective that human engage in actions within natural and social environments following habits and customs, using tools, acting on concepts, beliefs, theories, pursuing objectives, building a corpus of collective knowledge that's incorporated within language, ideas, concepts, theories, social practices, norms, rules, principles, institutions, everything, basically. So at any given time, the overwhelming bulk of knowledge and institutions in society are the legacy of previous successful actions new discoveries adding to, modifying, or replacing what came before. Now, the naturalistic component of their thinking was that humans, like all species, have natural traits and needs and engage in activities within natural and social environments aimed at really fundamental things like surviving, procreating, and improving the conditions of our existence. Here's a quote from Dewey that reflects this. Quote, man lives as animals live, eating, fighting, fearing, and reproducing. Now, Dewey also said that as time goes on, we develop this immense bodies of meaning and knowledge and institutions. So we continue through this into social institutions, uh, but fundamentally underlying it are these biological processes. So everything, reasoning, language, knowledge, values, institutions, everything humans do and create from a pragmatist perspective are within nature. And that's the important part of naturalism. It presents a processual vision of human social existence continually evolving with the accumulation of deployment of knowledge in the course of just pursuing our projects, trying to achieve our goals. Now, the issue of truths. So for the pragmatist, the truth consisted of beliefs that prove reliable and successful when acted upon. Um, true ideas, this is a quote, are those that we can assimilate, validate, corroborate, and verify. Uh, false ideas are those we cannot. 
Here's James. Our ideas must agree with realities, be such realities concrete or abstract, be they facts or be they principles, under penalty of endless inconsistency and frustration. Here's a quote from Dewey. If ideas, meanings, conceptions, notions, theories, systems are instrumental to an active reorganization of a given environment, to a removal of some specific trouble and perplexity, then the test of their validity and value lies in accomplishing this work. If they succeed in their office, they are reliable, sound, valid, good, and true. Uh, now, notice by my description that the pragmatic method of truth is, is oriented towards experience, towards actions, in that they're based on trying to try out courses of action aimed at objectives and observing the consequences, and all of this is occurring within a community of inquirers. It's also important to emphasize that this is not a subjectivist theory of truth grounded in individual beliefs, although some of the pragmatists said things at times that suggested this. In their careful writings, they accepted that there's an objective world out there, a real world that is independent of us, independent of our subjective opinions and our prejudices. Now, to again, to understand the pragmatists, it helps to realize that they were, and again, as I suggested, they came out of science. That was what they were most impressed by as knowledge. But they were also impressed by recent discoveries that led to a changing of understanding of what scientific theories are about. And those two most important discoveries in the late 19th century was the discovery of non-Euclidean geometry. And in the early 20th century is Einstein's uh, theory of rel relativity. Prior to that, everyone thought Newton was providing absolute timeless universal truths, or that uh, Euclidean ge geometry was absolute timeless universal truths. But with these new discoveries, these new theories, and the theories themselves created new facts, the facts defined in terms of what the theoretical assumptions are. So what they came to realize is the theories themselves, and this is a quote, this is a quote from James, theories become instruments, not answers to enigmas in which we can rest. So the pragmatists emphasize that on a daily basis, we just carry on our activities through routinized habits and customs, and that only when we're confronted with some kind of difficulty or a novel situation, do, do we then, are we then forced to uh, enter into a, a, an attitude of inquiry, trying to figure out what the difficulty is, proposing different ways of how to proceed, and then trying out these different ways to see which of them, uh, which of them works. So, now let me talk about what the pragmatists were, what their opponents were, because that's also critical to understanding what they were about. So at the time, the pragmatists were, the philosophy was dominated by uh, a particular approach that the pragmatists opposed. Uh, the, this approach um, was, and here's a quote from Dewey, the world in which philosophers put their trust, the philosophers of his day, turn of the 20th century and thereafter, the world in which philosophers put their trust was a closed world, Dewey wrote, a world consisting of intern internally of a limited number of fixed forms, having definite boundaries externally. But we live in an infinitely variegated world, he emphasized, so multiplex and far-reaching that it cannot be summed up or grasped by any one formula. Moreover, this, this is a conception of a universe whose evolution is not finished of a universe which is still, in James's term, in the process of becoming, of a universe up to a certain point that's still plastic. So the pragmatists brought a completely different perspective. Philosophers at the time were looking for absolute universal truths, and the pragmatists were coming and saying, no, that's not uh, what truths are and how they work. So here's another quote from James. The pragmatist, he says, quote, turns away from abstractions and insufficiency, from verbal solutions, from bad a priori reasons, from fixed principles, closed systems, and pretended absolutes and origins. He turns towards concreteness and adequacy, towards facts, towards action, and towards power. Okay, so that's the pragmatist view. And let me just briefly say why it's still relevant today. There was a kind of outburst of writing about pragmatism in the 90s, and Richard Rorty said, well, pragmatism is banal because everybody agrees with all of this nowadays. Well, in fact, it is banal in many respects, but it's not correct that everyone agrees with it. And a core group of writers who don't agree with it are analytical jurisprudence. 
And what I mean by that is analytical jurisprudence, the objectives and methods that are applied by analytical jurisprudence strongly echo the turn of the 20th century philosophers that the pragmatists were um, engaged in uh, uh, resisting. So here's a quote from Joseph Raj, just to give you a sense of what I mean by that. Raj writes, quote, a theory consists of necessary truths, for only necessary truths about the law reveal the nature of law. We talk about the nature of law or the nature of anything else to refer to those of the law's characteristics, which are the essence of law, which make law what it is. And this is repeated many times. I won't give all the quotes, uh, although I'll say add from Scott Shapiro to discover the law's nature, he says, would be to discover its necessary properties, that is, those properties that law could not have, could not fail to have. So essential and necessary features are elements of what they're looking for. But in addition, it's the claims that they make. And that claim is that their concepts or, or that law or truths about law are universally true for all societies. Green asserts, for example, the features necessary to law are those found not only in all existing and historical legal systems, but in all possible legal systems or all humanly possible legal systems. And those are numberless and unobservable. Now, some analytical jurisprudence mean universal truth literally. So Shapiro writes, quote, social science cannot tell us what the law is because it studies human society. Its deliverances have no relevance for the legal philosopher because it is a truism that non-humans can have law. So uh, Shapiro's argument is that the philosophical truths that they're uh, focusing on go far beyond what social science is about because social science is just about human behavior and they apparently are providing universal truths that apply to alien societies. I want to repeat this statement because I want to take off on it for a moment. He wrote, its deliverances have no relevance for the legal philosopher because it is a truism that non-humans have law. And I'm emphasizing that because uh, Shapiro's really quite excellent book is grounded on a series of what he claims are self-evident truisms that are so true that they cannot be disagreed with. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that a, a truism that non-humans, a statement that it's a truism that non-humans could have law should at least give you pause and ask, what, what does it mean to say that's a truism? And when you look at all of the truisms that Shapiro declares, I'm just going to suggest to you that these are just simply his own assumptions about law based on the systems that he's familiar with and do not reflect law at other times and places in other parts of the world. Now, again, I'm just focusing on their claims. So as I'm suggesting, they're looking at essential and necessary characteristics that are universally true for all societies. And it's not just that, it's that they hold for all places and all times. And this, again, is a quote from Raz. It's easy to explain in what sense legal philosophy is universal. Its theses, if true, apply universally. That is, they speak of all law, of all legal systems, of those that will that exist or will exist, and even those that can exist, though they never will. Moreover, its theses are advanced as necessarily universal. So in short, the target for the approach that I bring is precisely claims of this nature. Uh, analytical jurisprudence ground their analyses and conceptual analysis, intuitions, uh, declared self-evident tru truisms, with limited attention to empirical circumstances. Uh, pragmatism, in contrast, rejects necessary universal truths based on intuitions and self-evidence. Do we call self-evidence arguments based on self-evidence uh, ipsy dixit? Uh, that was a comment from Dewey. Uh, and the pragmatists instead emphasize attention to what people are doing with law and the consequences of their actions. Now let me move forward and address some core themes that uh, emerge from this pragmatist perspective. So one core theme is naturalism. And naturalism has multiple meanings. Um, one meaning is that only natural phenomenon exists and everything occurs within natural processes. So that's one meaning that I'm, uh, that is the core meaning that I'm adopting. And in particular, the pragmatists and Dewey especially were really influenced by the biological perspective so from a biological perspective, naturalism situates human social animals within evolutionary processes common to all species. And that what distinguishes us are primarily our intellectual ability, language, and our tool making capabilities. But other than that, we're subject to same natural requirements. 
So Dewey wrote uh, that reflective thought, quote, has its origin in biological adaptive behavior and the ultimate function of its cognitive aspect, thought that is, he's describing, is a perspective control of the conditions of our environment. So what does he mean by this? Well, we need food, we need clothing, shelter, we reproduce, we're physically vulnerable, we're roughly equal, we live in potentially dangerous environments with limiting resources. We are self-interested, but we're also altruistic. We compete, but we also cooperate. We create shared meanings and act in a myriad of ways to achieve our objectives, and yet we also have clashes. So the, the biological perspective then brings all, all, everything that we do within this sort of naturalistic environment, including, and this is the part I think is critical, including the social world that we create. That is the social world itself is a continuous with the uh, what we often think of as the natural world, when I'm suggesting that the social world is a part of the natural world. And uh, Dewey emphasizes that as time goes on, yes, we've gotten past the bare needs, although obviously, and sadly, in many societies, people are still struggling just for food, shelter, and water. But in other advanced societies, we've gone far beyond that uh, to now have as our concerns, the social institutions within which we operate. Now, the naturalistic perspective that I just out, just briefly outlined for you comes into play from a standpoint of understanding law at different levels and in different contexts. So I just wanna highlight for you a couple examples. So one example where this naturalistic perspective can help actually I think is fundamental to legal theory is that there's abundant support uh, from anthropologists, from archeologists, uh, from psychological studies that human existence requires basic rules of social interaction or social intercourse. That is based on human traits and the needs of social interaction, all social groups have fundamental rules that are similar. They're varied, but they have, they are addressing similar things. So for example, it's a common place that all human groups have uh, music and dance. Uh, obviously they all have language. They also have reciprocal gift giving, aesthetic standards, cosmology, meaning, meaning of our existence. Specifically in relation to law, all human groups have some versions of, excuse me, property rights, prohibitions against killing, redress for violent injuries or accidental injuries, rules related to marriage, inheritance, sexual restrictions, debt obligations. Versions of these things exist in all societies. Now, again, I wanna emphasize they vary greatly across societies subject to their cultural influences and other influences, and they also change over time. But, but all societies seem to have versions of this. Now, in addition to that, and again, I'm giving you some possible entry points for naturalism into law. In addition to that, it turns out that these fundamental rules are, their indications are undergirded by natural factors. For example, jurisprudence scholars and, and psychologists have been arguing in recent years about natural moral intuitions, immediate automatic reactions to injustice, or as one other philosopher wrote, an intuitive jurisprudence that's created as a structure in terms of how we think. Now, these are competing theories. I don't wanna suggest that it's all the same thing. What I am saying is what they're focusing on is identifying natural moral, uh, excuse me, natural impulses and instincts that serve to reinforce these basic rules of social uh, of social intercourse. And the reason that's important is because scholars have been speculating about this for some time. So for example, the great Adam Smith wrote or identified law or reactions to law with natural reactions to injustice. So here's a quote, fraud, falsehood, brutality, and violence excite reactions of scorn and abhorrence, Smith observed and murder, theft, and robbery call loudest for vengeance and punishment. This is an innate sense of justice, Smith talked about, that the main, which he said, quote, is provides the main pillar that upholds society without which it would crumble into atoms. Uh, George Herbert Mead, who I've mentioned several times, wrote, by the way, I should add that Mead himself was influenced by Adam Smith. So he wrote, the revulsions against criminality reveal themselves in a sense of solidarity within the group. A sense of being a citizen on the one hand excludes those who have transgressed the laws of the group and on the other hand inhibits tendencies to criminal acts in the citizen himself. Now again, let me emphasize why I'm focusing on this. 
So the first part I'm saying is naturalism suggests their basic rules that all societies have, and not only out of their needs, but these rules are supported by natural uh, aspects of our, our own behavior, including moral intuitions. And uh, recent neurological studies have lent significant support to these early speculations. For example, one study uh, was summarized as that the decision that human brains manifest brain states that provoke punishment when they perceive injustice. Quote, the decision to punish the passionate motivation to do so is a froth frothy limbic state. In other words, it's a state of a brain reaction. Um, so that's one set. Now, let me give you a different perspective on how naturalism applies to issues in jurisprudence and the sociology of law. So the emergence of legal systems themselves as organized complex uh, enforcing legal rules can be also be understood in evolutionary naturalistic terms. Uh, Hart gave a theory about why secondary rules emerged because the primary rules couldn't be changed. They, were, uh, they weren't officially applied and there were disagreements about what they were. Um, but from a, from a naturalistic perspective, a different explanation for the emergence of legal systems is the growth in group size and increases in social complexity. That is, societies became more in, differentiated internally. And one part of that differentiation is the emergence of a, a ruling, a ruling polity, and legal institutions that provide the enforcement muscle for that policy, for that polity. So the, and these are, what I'm summarizing for you comes from studies by archeologists and anthropologists of early chiefdoms uh, and ancient states, that these systems emerged and all of these systems uh, provide basic uh, rules for the society, but in addition, provide order within society. And in addition, which I'll talk about a little bit later, enforce hierarchy within society. Now, let me take up another completely different angle. Now, again, I'm just running through different ways naturalism influences law. So here's another set of ideas that naturalism bears on. Naturalism relates to concrete issues in the law. For example, studies have found that there's certain people for biological or reasons of what occurred in their upbringing are prone to violence, to pedophilia, or to other social, antisocial acts. And these issues bear not just on criminal punishment, but on how to deal with these, uh, with people with these conditions. Studies of brain development, for example, have found that teenagers uh, should be treated differently from adults for the purposes of civil and criminal liability, simply because their brains have not been fully developed. So theories we have about responsibility don't necessarily fully apply. Another example is that neurological studies have discovered the basis for subconscious biases linked to in-group versus out-group judgments. This is relevant to legal responses, for example, to discrimination. Studies have found evidence of biases in the perceptions of facts, motivated reasoning, ideological influences. We're all familiar with this now, or much more than we were before, and it can be incorporated at lots of different levels. And for example, specifically relating to decision making of legal officials, who do we prosecute and why? Or judicial application and judges apply laws, what subconscious influences are there are affecting their decisions? Okay, so these are all, again, different ways naturalism comes into play. In closing the discussion of naturalism, I want to emphasize an important point, and that is that the pragmatists did not, although natural factors pervade everything, uh, the, the pragmatists emphasize that this does not lead to determinism. That is, not, it, it does not suggest that all of our behavior is determined by natural factors. These natural influences are not fixed in their extent or in their expression, nor are they all encompassing. That's why variations exist. Moreover, contingency is a fundamental trait of nature. So there's always contingency. And moreover, humans generate meaning and instrumental actions aimed at improving the circumstances of their existence. So we're always, always going beyond whatever these natural requirements or however they're infusing us. Okay, so let me stop there. I will now go on very quickly to address historicism and holism. This is the next uh, set of ideas. So the idea of historicism is that law exists temporarily. It's extended from the past to the continually constructed present and always projecting towards the future. 
Now, this idea that law itself is temporarily extended is true in the narrow sense that every law passed today is meant to apply tomorrow, right? And we apply going forward and until it's withdrawn. But it's also true of law in the broad sense. And the broad sense is that law itself is a historical product. Law is an inherited tradition that changes over time in relation to surrounding factors that are, sh and that are shaped and, co and conditioning future developments within society. So what, whatever we have in law today is a function of what we had before. And in order to understand law, we have to understand how law transformed over time to become what it was today. And the famous jurist that made this point, or one of the famous jurists was Oliver Wendell Holmes. So he wrote, the law embodies, quote, the law embodies the story of a nation's development through many centuries, and it cannot be dealt with as if it is contained only the axioms and cor corollaries of a book of mathematics. In order to know what law is, we must know what it has been and what it tends to be become. Now, in addition to the idea, so that's what I call horse, historicism, law, looking at law as temporally extended. In addition to its temporal extension, law extends spatially throughout society. What I mean by that is law is interconnected with culture, economy, polity, social structures, technology, ecosystem, everything. All aspects of society are inextricably intertwined. This is an ontological proposition, by the way. And it's the, the interconnections within society, I, I, and this is really important to add, are mutually constitutive. And what I mean by that is that social influences seep into law and influence law in a multitude of ways everywhere, in every way possible, while at the same time, law gives rise to and stands behind a multitude of social arrangements. That's what I mean by mutually constitutive. And so law, from this perspective, is integrated within the social whole constituting as well as shaped by surrounding factors. And this, looking at the law this way is what I call historicism. Now, uh, excuse me, holism. Now, holism and historicism are the same basic view. Just historicism emphasizes the temporal and holism emphasizes the spatial extension. Now, let me just give you a quick example of this. George Herbert Mead wrote an article in 1915. Uh, it was an essay on the meaning of natural rights. And he runs through the history of natural rights, talking about Hobbes, Locke, the Declaration of Independence, the US, the French Declaration of the Rights of Man. And his point was that at any given time, rights declarations were made with specific, quote, specific dangers and hindrances and particular objectives in mind. But he wrote, thereafter, rights become abstract. So they're emptied of meaning. And then that meaning is applied in new circumstances and given those rights applied in new circumstances and new meaning given by the struggles at that particular time. So Mead wrote, quote, we started with life, liberty, security, equality, pursuit of happiness as natural rights, but over time they were, quote, incapable of definition as to their content. It is evident, again, I'm Continuing with a quote, the categories which are to serve all these purposes must be abstract and empty of content, and that they should give their content, get their content through the struggle which arises on the bare floor between their distant walls. And the struggle at the time he was writing was the struggle between laborers and capital about the conditions of employment. So Mead is writing in a way in which he applies the historical approach and the holistic approach, saying what's influencing the meaning of law over time changes and the fights over rights or the meaning of rights depends on any contemporary battle that's going on. And by the way, we can see exactly this today in terms of rights talk and gay rights, for example, or rights of transsexuals, uh, which was not what how rights were being discussed a few decades ago. So these two ideas, historicism and holism, have had in the past jurisprudential schools attached to them. Historicism was the centered on by the school called historical jurisprudence. Um, holism was focused on by the school called his, uh, sociological jurisprudence. Now, I'm not going to run through the jurisprudential schools. I just identify them to show you that there are links with these approaches that I'm identifying with pre-existing jurisprudential approaches. I'll just say that there are lots of different purposes that you can bring to bear for historicism. So historical lens can show, for example, that a rule has been around for a long time, 
And that reflects the benefits that it gives to society. That's why we still have it. Or you can look at a rule over a long period of time and that undermines the legitimacy of the law. For example, by showing that its origins were bad or arbitrary, and it's been kept in place mainly through inertia or blind traditionalism. Uh, another use of the historical approach is to show that a given that in the past, a given historical uh, legal concept was might have been beneficial, but current circumstances have changed. So it no longer works that way. And now it's bad. Or another use of historical circumstances is to show that this law has been in place over time, but society's changed so much that it now works counter to what our social objectives are. These examples I'm mentioning, mentioning actually come out of work done in terms of studies in historical jurisprudence. Okay, the sociological jurisprudence, I'll again just say quickly, and this is related to holism, focuses on the social influences surrounding law. As I said, everything, ecology, uh, the polity, culture, technological advance, uh, changes seeping into law at every turn. The one thing I wanna add to that, that the pragmatists focus on is, the focus is not just on legal institutions. Legal philosophers and theorists often look at what legal officials do, but lots of changes in law actually come by, through the day-to-day -day activities of lawyers, creating and structuring new transactions for the purposes of their clients. And this is something that Mead emphasized as well as Cardozo, as well as Pound in sociological jurisprudence. The bottom line for this, bringing it back to, to uh, jurisprudence generally is, these various interconnections between law and society, which are manifold and dynamic, and the ties, the temporal ties, suggest that viewing law in isolation is fundamentally flawed. That is, you cannot understand law. If you don't, at some level, understand its, its temporal existence and changes over time, and if you don't understand that it's integrated with society. Now, let me just give you a quick uh, concrete example of the difference that, that this makes the significance of historicism and holism. Only a historicist and holist perspective can tell us why the rule of law developed in some societies over time and not others. There's no other way to explain this. Furthermore, only a historicist and holist perspective can account for the reality that rule of law societies, pick them, France, US, Japan, Germany, rule of societies, all of them consist of very different uh, institutional arrangements. And it's that fact that they are both historical and related to society that explains why you can have or how you can end up with different institutional arrangements that create what will nevertheless be recognized as some common thing called the rule of law. Okay, let me very time, let me very quickly now cover social constructionism. Uh, just pause for a moment. So the, the idea of social constructionism, I think, is very familiar today. So just as a basic idea, the, the social world is the product of our meaningful actions and their intended and unintended consequences. It's created by us, the social world. It's created by us collectively. But the social world pre-exists individuals, and it survives. So we just come and go, but the social institutions are there, and they can create a continued existence. So people are born in to assume a place in partake of and modify existing language, knowledge, conventions, social practices, and institutions. And all of these actions, and I want to emphasize intentional and unintentional consequences. So all these actions collectively give rise to the world, the world that we exist in and simply take for granted. The world of what? Hospitals, schools, petrol stations, office buildings, factories, courts, uh, law schools, um, and everything else in society. So these social phenomenon, and they're everywhere, uh, we just take for granted in our daily lives. We're just operating within already existing institutions. Uh, so I'm not going to go into the details, but I use Mead's ideas to talk about the social construction of law. And he emphasizes that the way law operates is all different people in society have different roles, and these roles in the aggregate constitute what he called a kind of generalized other and that this is how our systems operate. So here's a quick quote that gives rise to what he called the common response. So the common response is the response of the community. For example, he says, to property. The common response varies with the character of the individual. This is Mead now. 
In the case of theft, the response of the sheriff is different from that of the attorney general and from that of the judges and jurors and so forth. And yet they're all responses that maintain property, which involves the recognition of property rights in others. So it's a common response in varied forms that in the aggregate result in uh, recognition of property. So uh, the idea in this socially constructed world is that people work within organizations built on conventionally recognized roles, responsibilities, routines, practices, and roles. It all hangs together, even though it's not necessarily the case that anyone understands, any one person understands every aspect of it, and many people don't. They know what their role is and maybe have a general idea of how it fits in. Now, importantly, Mead did not claim that people's actions are determined by their institutional roles and responsibilities. To the contrary, like all pragmatists, he recognized that there's a pluralism of perspectives among individuals and that this affects how these things played out. So he wrote, quote, the, that these rules and responsibilities afford plenty, quote, plenty of scope for originality, flexibil flexibility, and a variety of conduct. All of these social institutions, he emphasized, are not just created on an ongoing basis, but also creatively modified. They're extended. They can also be breached and ignored, uh, as well as followed. And they all have degrees of indeterminacy and contingency. Nor did Mead believe that all of these organizations operate smoothly together in society. He wrote that conflicts are ubiquitous. So, quote, each social institution with the good that it subtends asserts and maintains itself but finds itself in that assertion in conflict with other institutions and their goods. Now, the important thing about the social constructionist perspective, and again, I'm using it by way of contrast to analytical jurisprudence, is that it's based on a ground up perspective grounded in conventional recognition. That's the key that I wanna emphasize, that conventional recognition tells us what you're doing in, in any particular institution and in law specifically, Conventional recognition tells us who counts as a legal official, what legal powers they have, uh, what they need to do to create uh, something that counts as official law. In law, we call this rules of validity or rules of recognition. So social, the idea of social convention, convention recognizes all of this. And ultimately laws, whatever legal officials say law is through their collectively recognized conventions and roles. So this, again, I want to emphasize is a sort of ground up perspective on how law is created. And as with naturalism, I'm just going to identify a couple different places where it gives rise to questions in analytical jurisprudence. So one question that immediate or one challenge for analytical jurisprudence that immediately arises is that the focus of much of analytical jurisprudence is on law as a system of rules. So for example, Hart writes that law is a union of primary rules of obligation and secondary rules utilized to recognize change and apply the primary rules. And indeed, a big part of law involves the creation and application of rules for social ordering. And the primary rules are rules of social obligation. Everyone knows this story. It's a brilliant reduction of law. However, law does a lot more and lots of law does not involve rules. And this you can see if you look at it from the ground up perspective. Law is actually, in the modern world, certainly a multifunctional tool that can take any form and be used for any purpose. And I just want to give one monumentally important purpose of law that is not about enforcing rules, and that is enabling acts. So enabling acts are not rules. They're actually performative devices that accomplish things by declaration. They're usually marked by words like, I hereby establish, I hereby create, or enabling acts can terminate, I hereby terminate or abolish. Enabling acts create, uh, or termination acts can terminate. Enabling acts create government agencies. They reorganize government agencies. Termination acts wipe agencies out of existence. Enabling acts create corporations. All of these things are done by declaration. And I mentioned the two biggest forms of organizations that dominate modern existence, corporations, and government bureaucracies, both of which are creations of law. They're actors of law. They're not, that's just not about legal rules. It's about creating new actors. There are lots of other examples about uh, aspects of law that are not about enforcement of rules of obligation and a set of rules, but I'm gonna go on. The second claim I want to focus on very quickly is the claim, and this is repeated almost uniformly by analytical jurisprudence, and that is that the function of law 
is to guide conduct. Now, I'm just going to very quickly say that if that's true, it presupposes that people know what the law is, one, and number two, that they consult the law beforehand. You cannot have your conduct guided if you don't know the law and haven't consulted it beforehand and hasn't, haven't had it factor into your decision-making process in some way or another. Uh, and I just want to emphasize that we have lots of studies that show that large percentages of people do not know what the law is or, and or have erroneous assumptions about law. And also, certainly in the United States that I'm familiar with, that people don't consult law beforehand, either because they don't have money or simply because they think they know what the law is. And so they're just operating on their assumptions. The point, again, I'm suggesting is from this perspective, the suggestion that law guides conduct is highly questionable. Um, I'll add very quickly one other thing because I want to get to the instrumentalism. The other point I want to suggest is that if you view law as a matter of what people conventionally recognize as law, you also immediately are, understand the existence of legal pluralism, which I've written a fair amount recently. Legal pluralism is the recognition of the fact within societies there are groups of people that recognize forms of law. This includes state law, but it also includes religious law, customary laws, and international law, by the way. Okay, let me just quickly say some things about instrumentalism, power, and ideal ideals, and then I'll stop there. So pragmatism presents an instrumental view of all social institutions, not just law. Here's a quote from Mead that institutions, quote, are the tools and implements of the community. Now it's true, this is Mead, that social arrangements, laws, institutions are made for man rather than that man is made for them. And they, they are means and agencies of human welfare and progress. Um, uh, Dewey, Dewey observed laws through and through a social phenomenon, social in origin, in purpose or end, and in application. Quote, and this is a really nice phrase because it captures how I have come to think about it over time. Quote, a given legal arrangement is what law does. And what it does lies in the field of modifying and or maintaining human activities as going concerns. It follows from this perspective that you must know the consequences of law. If you have an instrumental view of law, the idea is that if my goal is to achieve social uh, objectives, I have to pay attention to what law does and the consequences of law. I will skip that. I just want to emphasize that it, uh, one, a great early 19th century, uh, midnight, late 19th century scholar, Rudolf von Jering, talked about law uh, in instrumental terms. Law as a means to an end is his fa famous book, but he also wrote a great short book called The Struggle for Law that talked about how individuals use law instrumentally to achieve their objectives and social groups use law instrumentally to achieve their objectives and society achieve, uses law to achieve. So this is a classic and pure instrumental view of law. Now I'm gonna just say one thing, if you view law instrumentally, you have to, it carries with it a methodological consequence. That is, you must pay attention to consequences. You must also pay attention then to who's controlling law, who's using law, what purposes has the law been used for? And this gives rise to what I'll quickly say, the ideal and the critical view. The ideal view, often espoused by legal philosophers, is law is a, there to advance the social good, it's an instrument of social welfare, it's the basis for a so, just social order, and you know, Scott Shapiro declared it's the mark of civilization. But of course, there's another view, and that view is the critical view, which looks at power and unequal distribution of wealth and resources and looks at law as a means of domination uh, that enforces and entrenches social economic and political hierarchies among along various lines caste race wealth class gender religion and others now what i'm saying is a pragmatic realistic approach takes into consideration both views not one view not the other but you need to at least saw, see law from both these idealized side and also from the critical standpoint. And from that perspective, you then get to see who is using law, who's wielding it, for what purposes, who's writing it. Very quickly about ideals. The pragmatists were known for their views called meliorism. Meliorism is about social reform, trying to make things better. Uh, by the way, this is also the orientation of a, of a theory of law. It looks, like, looks at law this way. And meliorism focuses on the importance of ideals. Legal ideals like equality, for example, are fundamentally important. 
we've been talking about equality for several decades now, uh, centuries now, but equality, the meaning of equality changes over time. And the thing that ideals serve are ways of evaluating and challenging existing arrangements and providing arguments that point in the direction of future change. And what the pragmatists emphasize is what they called, exper or Dewey called experimental instrumentalism. That is, identify social problems, try to do based, use empirically informed decision making about different possible ways of dealing with it, implementing the reforms, observing the consequences, then reevaluating the ideals as well as the reform and the consequences, and then moving forward in the next step. That is this constant process of ideals, evaluation, examination, excuse me, examination of consequences, evaluation, and reform and improvement again and again. And I will stop on that note. Uh, thank you very much. Um, now is time for a discussion. Uh, as I said, we have 30 minutes or even a little bit more since the professor finished eight minutes earlier. Uh, I give a floor to the, uh, uh, to you. You can raise the question by, uh, you can ask the question by raising your virtual, virtual hand, the real hand. So. The floor is yours. Okay, we have a question from uh, Professor Damar Banovic. Um, good evening. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you, Professor, for your, um, uh, for your lecture. Um, and you probably know I'm quite a um, uh, regular reader of your work. Uh, yeah, it looks like we lost the connection. And I also, um, uh, I've lost the connection over here. I, I'm back. <laughs> it's working. Yes. Hi, yes, you're okay. back. Because at some point I was, uh, I just saw the frozen faces. <laughs> uh, so once again, thank you for your, for your lecture. Um, I'm quite a regular reader of your work. Uh, almost all, all of the books I read. Uh, actually, I quit uh, using a lot also in my in my approaches and trying to combine some of your insights. Um, I mean, I have a lot of questions, but I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna um, uh, use the, the opportunity to ask all of them. Um, maybe they're not gonna relate to your uh, current speech, but maybe something um, uh, related to some of your uh, thesis, especially with this uh, uh, legal commercialism and social constructivism. Um, in some of your books, I think that was in general jurisprudence, some at the end of the book said that um, uh, law is something which we conventionally recognize as law, uh, this idea of conventionalism in the, within the legal theory. And I was also wondering how, um, in, because in some of my work, I also like, like to try to combine this idea of conventionality with the this, this idea which you brought in uh, uh, in one of your books, like law is whatever we conventionally recognize as law. Um, and somehow I was trying to combine with um, uh, with this idea of uh, legal conventionalism uh, and relating this legal con conventionalism with the uh, rules of recognition. Um, I was actually wondering, because also you, you propose different different views in, in your work, how this idea of um, um, uh, actually, the thesis within the legal uh, commercialism and social uh, social uh, commercialism actually can uh, actually how uh, legal theory can benefit from this. Um, if, I, if I'm um, if I'm I mean I'm not maybe precise in this, but um, 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 how it can actually legal theory can benefit from this. Uh, I mean, we've, a lot of your work you also use uh, in instrumentalism, pragmatism, but you also brought in this in this last book this idea of legal uh, of social uh, 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 constructivism how we can actually benefit uh, legal theory from this or where do you see these places concretely where we can actually apply it maybe in the rules of recognition or the like where is the like step further in the legal theory so i i, I hope i made uh, myself clear thank you i i will try to answer um the best i can um uh... I mean, it, it does kick in at different levels. So I would say 
the most fundamental level of collective recognition can be found in the work of Searle on collective recognition of social institutions. So that's basic. That's that's the basic ontology of social institutions, right? And I, I believe he's correct that that social institutions at the most fundamental levels based on collective recognition. Now his theory is more nuanced, and all people can read it for themselves. And I summarize it actually in that book, um, sociological approaches to theories of law. So that's at the on most basic ontological level of institutions. But there's another level of collective recognition, and that is co a collective recognition of the thing called law, right? law itself. And what I'm suggesting in multiple works, I have been suggesting for 20 years now, um, is that law itself is a folk concept, a folk concept. And that is, it's a concept that people create through their activities. By the way, when I say law, I'm saying law and all of its translations. Um, so the folk concept of law, I have suggested over time, is a matter itself of collective recognition. That is, law as a, as a folk concept is what people identify as law. That, for me, is an insight also, but not at the basic ontological level, but at the basic level of social constructionism. That is what makes something uh, a law legal institution, or I put it simply, what makes something a petrol station uh, has to do with the people who are running that institution, uh, doing it in terms of what it is the activities of that institution are, and the things that are law are recognized within communities as such. Now, what that leads to, this now, the level of conventional recognition of law, what, what that leads to is then the question of uh, looking out within societies and asking, well, what do they recognize as law? And it turns out, and I've suggested in other works, that different things have been recognized, not one thing, and that these things have changed over time. This is where historicism and holism is coming into play, and that things that are recognized as law actually have evolved over time. By the way, the point, and I want to inject this again as in reference to analytical jurisprudence, how can there be timeless universal truths if we acknowledge that law evolves over time? You see, there's a fundamental problem. There's a clash between these understandings. So I would say this, the two most basic levels are conventional recognition at the basic ont ontological ontology of institutions level, slash Searle, then conventional recognition of law as a folk concept, law as a folk concept, and then we have conventional recognition within law by legal officials agreeing upon what sets of rules they follow to recognize valid law. So you see these are different levels where it kicks in. So I think that's the best way to kind of respond to you. Okay. By the way, I'm not Thanks saying it's much. only those, but those are, I think, are the most often that we talk about in law. Yeah, because some, somehow I think uh, that was also my idea, how, but I just wanted to like uh, to hear your opinion. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, do we have more questions? Um, uh, yes, Professor Boyens Pajch and uh, Julieta Rabanos, are you both having questions? Only one of you. Do you have well, one we, we, we'll, joint question? We haven't we agreed on this. Actually, it was my hand, my virtual hand being great. I'm closer to the point here, uh, but Julieta might have a question. Uh, very glad to see you. Thank you for a wonderful lecture. It's related to Damir's question somehow, and it's about kind of the full concept of law and your um, approach in um, your approach in law, which is a decidedly sociological approach. And I, of course, love reading uh, your work in the last kind of more than 15 years, I think. And I was always wondering whether this sociological criticism, even if we started from conventionalism or if we started from pragmatism, uh, actually endangers the entirety of what we usually call conceptual analysis in law. Uh, let's uh, use kind of an example, like in, um, Every time that you that we, for example, analyze um, the the historical changes of law, or we analyze legal pluralism, or we analyze our accounts of law, even if we analyze our full concepts of law, 
I think that we are usually warranted in, in asking the question, what are we analyzing? And I, uh, in, in the following sense, so aren't we able to determine some properties without designating them as essential, without designating them as necessary, or without designating them as needed in all, or indispensable in all possible worlds, or however we want to frame it. In other words, for example, we could say that your whole concept of law pretty much aligns or aligns rather well with some more modest conceptions of conceptual analysis. For example, one that starts from the ordinary meaning of the words or the terms or even the dictionary meaning of the terms in order to develop uh, by ways of, let's say, conceptual analysis broadly conceived, some properties that, let's say, are generally um, are generally present in all legal systems known to us, and so on and so on. So I'm all, I, I'm usually left with the impression that while descriptively uh, sociological theories of law can give valuable insights in uh, what, or answers to the question what law is and what law is in various times, we are still left with this, at least on the most this most general level, we are still left with this question of whether we can identify actually these necessary properties of our whole concept of law, or if you want our just usual ordinary meaning of the word law and so on. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's a really excellent question. Uh, so, I basically agree with you, and I but I agree with what you described as the project. So, if the project is, uh, we'll call it modest conceptual analysis. By modest, I mean the claims that are made about what it is you're producing. Then I think conceptual analysis is fundamental. In fact, I don't think you can do this without conceptual analysis. One of the problems is I think. I actually think I do a lot of conceptual analysis. <laughs> so there's questions about what the separating point is at some certain level. I don't feel the need to separate, but I will say that I don't want I don't want to give the wrong impression. I think analytical jurisprudence produces many important insights. So I'm I'm reading it as well, and I'm not out to say that somehow discredit what's going on there. What I am trying to do in this work, and I actually don't see myself as an analytical jurisprudent. Obviously, I'm writing from a contrasting perspective. I'm defining them in some ways as the approach that I'm contrasting my own view with. Um, but I do think that what I'm saying is it's fine to do conceptual. It's not fine. I should say it more strongly than that. It's essential to do conceptual analysis. And yet it's also important to understand when you're making assertions that are actually not just conceptual analysis, but made up or in based on your own assumptions. And I think that's the part that I'm cautioning. I'm saying, look, wait a minute. If you say that, for example, that the function of law is to guide conduct, which many analytical jurisprudence have said, then step two is just ask, okay, does law guide conduct? And when if you see reasons where, that might question that, then reevaluate the claim. Or if you say, for example, all, all societies have one supreme system of law, this is what the that's what the concept of law means. And lots of Ra's discussion is about law being supreme and claiming uh, authority over everything in society and ordering society, that's fine. If that's what uh, the Western concept of law that he's based on is contains within it, then that's an important insight. And then the next move is to ask, and yet, does that reflect either under concepts of law in other societies, or does that reflect the reality of law in other societies? So I'm I'm saying the fundamental Conceptual analysis is really important. I, I actually support that, and I think it's essential to what we're doing. And I'm just asking for a second step where you now evaluate your intuitions or your conceptual analysis in relation to what's out there. And too often what I've seen in uh, the work of analytical jurisprudence, I've suggested is 
debates about societies of angels, for example, and yet not looking at developing countries as another example. In this book that I wrote on sociological approaches to the concept of law, I cite a remarkable provision statement from Hart's concept of law that I've never seen discussed in a philosophical work. Now, it might have been, I've just never seen it. And that statement was about rules of recognition. So let me just say quickly what that says, because it's I think it's an amazing statement. So what Hart said, and now the book was published in 1961, what Hart said was that during the colonial regimes, in colonial regimes, the rule of recognition, the ultimate rule of recognition of the colony was what the Queen and Parliament said in England. Now, just that statement for me is remarkable because it says already that the basic rule of recognition for law in a country in Africa wasn't the African community, wasn't anyone there. It was the rule of recognition of the Queen and Parliament. So again, he had a set of doctrines, and yet he, when he talked about reality, and that was the reality, he didn't look at the implications of that reality that he was talking about. He was just playing out the analytical implications of the rule of recognition, and he followed it where he led. Had he looked at African countries when he wrote that, an example I discuss is Ghana, which happened to have gone independent, right, in the years leading up to him, his writing of the, of the concept of law. Uh, it turns out, had he paid any attention at all, he would have realized that the vast bulk of the population in Ghana did not follow state law. That was written about at the time. What they followed was customary law recognized within the community. By the way, it's still true today, which is the other remarkable thing. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is there were moments in the conceptual analysis where he referred to outside things, but never then empirical things but never then looked at that as a way to question the concept, the products of his conceptual analysis. That's what I'm trying to say. And so I love his reduction. I really do. His reduction to primary and secondary roles, I love it. But, uh, but then you go forward and ask, okay, now what does this look like in Ghana, for example? Does, does my scheme still work or do I have to amend it? It's a long way of saying I'm very for conceptual analysis. I just want more consulting of the empirical reality to check what that analysis is doing. Point one, I want more empirical checks. And point two, I do not believe claims of universal truths for all times and places that never existed and never will and, and, and other planets. I do not believe those can either hold up uh, or are useful. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next question goes to Professor Mia Dragivanovic. Uh, hi, Brian. It's really nice to, to see you. We've been trying to bring you to Belgrade for quite some time. Uh, eventually, it's uh, in this form, but uh, nevertheless, it was really a, a great pleasure to, to listen to your lecture. I just wanted basically to add uh, and to ask you, uh, actually, uh, to what extent some also of the discussions uh, in the anthropology uh, and the anthropology proper can be integrated into the the, the entire package of uh, of claims and theses uh, uh, that also sociological approach to law. Uh, Foster, uh, you mentioned just a couple of minutes ago that uh, Hart published uh, his The Concept of Law in 1961. We all know that, obviously, but uh, it's an interesting thing that in the exactly the same year of 1961, Margaret Mead, the famous uh, anthropologist, published uh, in Natural Law Forum, uh, she published an article called Some Anthropological considerations concerning natural law. Basically, uh, she wanted to, uh, to show that uh, empirical investigation of, uh, of the then anthropology could confirm that there, there were certain universal, uh, uh, universal elements in uh, legal orders of uh, virtually all known societies, including those that were back then called uh, 
uh, primitive uh, uh, legal orders. And just to, to mention, the, uh, there were basically three uh, important uh, findings. The sacredness of human life, which means that uh, all societies were making distinctions between justified and unjustified killing. Then there was in all uh, societies some version of the incest taboo. And the uh, third one was uh, that there was some sort of a, a protection of uh, certain aspects of privacy uh, in, in all regimes. Uh, and it's uh, interesting to compare these findings, for instance, with uh, uh, Hart's uh, own more kind of an armchair anthropological findings uh, when claiming what are natural, uh, what, what are the minimum content of uh, uh, natural law and mor moralities. Because uh, in the same way, uh, uh, Margaret Mean basically found that all, and I'm now I'm, I'm reading her uh, quote, uh, all known cultures make it highly probable that the kinds of cultural behavior found in all of them have been an integral part of their survival system up to the present time. And we all know that uh, Hart was also interested in uh, systems uh, which uh, which were, of course, uh, 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 directed towards uh, survival. And the other thing from the anthropology that uh, always kind of uh, remind me of the current methodological debate between sociological approach to law and analytical uh, jurisprudence is the discussion, methodological discussion from the mid-15s between two famous anthropologists, Paul Bohannon and Max Gluckman. The idea was basically with what methodological apparatus to approach those societies. Uh, on the one hand, uh, Gluckman uh, argued that uh, we should use the standard of the reasonable man, which was obviously uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, applied or uh, uh, introduced from the background of the Western uh, theories, whereas Bohannon argued that we should approach law as a folk system, the one that we have to we have to uh, research from the even term terminological uh, and conceptual apparatus of the of the society that we investigate. So I would just, you know, like adding some, some elements to what you were talking yeah. and uh, being interested in whether this uh, can be of some help in, in, in uh, clarifying the positions that you, that you carved out. Yeah, thank you for those comments. I mean, that's very helpful. I'm actually writing and have been for two years now, um, a book about natural law. And I'm explaining natural law from a pragmatist standpoint. And so a part of that will be drawing on some of these insights, including the Mead art, art article, which I had read about but forgot. So thanks you for that. I'm going to actually print that out as soon as the talk is over. I want to say something about what you mentioned about Hart. So Hart, as you said, focus on what he called the minimum content of natural law, and that is protection of, of persons, property, and, and enforcement of promises. And his basics, he just basically speculated that, you know, all social groups have this. I think he's right. And that's what a reference I made that I made to uh, the fundamental rules of social intercourse or interaction. I want to say that when he said that, he also wrote that that uh, that information about that is not the subject of truisms. It's something that you have to investigate through. And he wrote sociological and psychological investigation. That's a perfect illustration of what I was trying to say that he made this, I think, really important insight, and yet it's simply not been taken up. So he said, we, we philosophers can't solve this by ourselves. We can speculate about it. By the way, his ideas on this, you can take from Hume as well. Um, but that's where it stops, right? If the idea is uh, analytical jurisprudence want to explore a minimum content of natural law, which he famously declared, then that's not based on intuitions and conceptual analysis, even according to Hart. Now you have to consult what we can learn from science about these things. Uh, thank you very much. The next question is to Maciej Pichlak, if I'm pronounced that well. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Professor Tamanaha, for your lecture. Uh, 
let me first add to 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 this as an instant follow up that that the 1961 is also the year in which Philip Selznick publishes his sociology and natural law article, which I think is a nice fit to this discussion. Um, uh, and actually, my question is also somehow related to this problem uh, and to the empirical check to the uh, conceptual analysis that you have mentioned. Because um, uh, the question is, uh, the question I would like to pose is, uh, do you define or do you put any uh, methodological requirements or any methodological threshold that such empirical check for conceptual analysis should meet? Because it seems to me that the main problem with concept with analytical jurisprudence is not that uh, it lacks such a test, right? I mean, in Hart or Russ or any other analytical jurisprudence philosophers, we can find these references to, we, we can find some empirical, empirical arguments. The problem is that this is mainly, this what has been mentioned before, this kind, this armchair kind of, uh, of sociology uh, based on common sense intuitions and anecdotal evidences that does not meet the, the requirements of robust empirical, empirical research. Uh, so if we really want to treat seriously right, the demand that conceptual analysis is supported or verified or, 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 or tested against against this what we can meet in the uh, in the real praxis of, of, of societies uh, how much should we rely in your opinion on the methods offered by uh, sociology or social science in general uh, and how much this uh, this kind of argument that I think jurisprudence is more used to that means common sense intuitions might may be accepted yes let me answer your question in a different way and then to to explain which I need to lay out as a background. So I've written in other works that I believe there's jurisprudence is let a thousand flowers bloom. That's my view. There's lots of different versions of it, perspectives, but I've kind of it helps in my view to think about three general branches of jurisprudence. One I would call normative jurisprudence, and that's example natural law theory and things of that nature. The other is um, we could call legal positivism slash analytical jurisprudence, which is dominated by legal positivists. And the third branch, what I would call social historical jurisprudence. What I, I, I need to lay these out here because if you were to ask me, what am I doing? I would say, well, I'm not doing um, normative jurisprudence. I'm not doing analytical jurisprudence slash legal positivism. I'm doing social historical jurisprudence. And that type of jurisprudence completely integrates conceptual analysis, consulting empirical studies, and so forth. So from my standpoint, what I describe for you are the positions that I think we need to explore if we're going to create a sophisticated theoretical understanding of law. That's what I'm proposing. Now, let me go to analytical jurisprudence and how you framed it. It's for them, I think, to ultimately decide what is acceptable or necessary in terms of consultation. I will say that I have a concern about how these discussions go in the context of analytical jurisprudence. And the concern is that we don't have real criteria for when a, a disconfirming example is sufficient to say your theory is wrong. So I'll give you an example. So legal theorists, analytical jurisprudence have, have debated, you know, what counts as law or what, what qualifies as law. And there their theories uniformly are grounded in the assumption that state law is law and that law provides the standard for identifying what counts as law. Uh, when analytical jurisprudence then are count given counterexamples, like I have in my own work, well, what about law in developing countries? What, what about customary law? There, there are two responses that I've seen. One response is, well, that doesn't count as law because it doesn't, I'm challenging the criteria for law and when I give an example that says the criteria is wrong, their answer is no, based on the criteria, that's not law. So if that's not law, it's not a disconforming example. So their, their theory remains untouched by the counterexample. 
The second alternative that's been used is to say, not to say that's not law, but to say that's a deviation of law or that is a defective form of law. Now, notice that both of these approaches maintain the theory of law unscathed by any kind of empirical counter argument because every counter argument can be rejected or parried by saying, no, that example is not law. It doesn't qualify. Or no, that example is defective law. And I'm, we're talking about the true law law. So that's my concern. My concern is if you're going to do conceptual analysis and if you're going to accept that empirical reality somehow matters, then you have to come up with ways of at least saying when your theory of law will be disconfirmed. How many examples do I have to give where you start rethinking that maybe your theory of law is incorrect? And that for me is a fundamental problem because it's the, the, the analysis is constructed in a way that keeps false, attempts at falsification at bay. Um, so now again, I'm talking about analytical jurisprudence. I'm agreeing with your concern. I'm saying not only do I not have an answer, I have a specific concern about the way in which conceptual analysis treats empirical counterexamples. And I'm raising that to say, I think that's the fundamental problem that analytical jurisprudence have to themselves take seriously the idea that their theories are somehow testable, somehow. Thank you very much for this. However, I wouldn't like to focus so much on analytical jurisprudence, but even more yeah. on your perspective of sociological jurisprudence, which is which is also much closer to 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 to, to my own approach and that which I admire very much. So the question is, from your perspective, what defines the sound empirical argument for you? Uh, I'm not sure how to answer that question. So let me resort. Okay, maybe to... it's too abstract. So yeah. sorry for, for, well, for, for this, but, but right. how to, how, let me phrase this another way, how to avoid using anecdotal evidences, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and seemingly plausible yet not robust enough empirical arguments. Yeah. This is just a matter of intellectual exchange. I mean, I don't think there's a formula for what you're asking me to do. The pragmatic view is get out, get your theory out there, have testable predictions, attempts at verification, falsification, see if it works, see if it's reliable. But I don't think you can identify in advance any kind of methodological threshold. Uh, I, I'm just saying we have to be aware, we have to be cognizant, we have to be willing to subject it to testing. Uh, the pra the pra pragmatist view is that theories are instruments. Theories themselves are instruments. We have objectives. We're trying to figure something out. Try it. See if it works. And the trying it isn't just experimenting, but trying try it by applying it to other contexts and see whether or not it withstands um, these kinds of counterexamples or critiques. Um, so I guess the best answer to you, or the only answer, I don't have a better one, is that there there's no specific rule we can set up in advance to address any of these methodological issues. The pragmatist view is really about subjecting to testing, verification, and to the extent that those insights hold up in relation to objectives that we have, that's enough, that's good, that's reliable, that's something for us to believe on until we come across a counterexample that can't be explained. The pragmatist approach really emphasizes fallibilism. That is, I, I believe things that are true and true, really true. But I'm really willing, I'm willing to accept that at some point, it turns out I had a view about law not necessarily guiding people. Well, if there are lots of evidence that in fact people are guided by law ex ante, I will change my position. Um, but so far I see mostly evidence that they're not. So until I see something otherwise, I will, Stick with that. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much all. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for participating. Uh, then thank you all of uh, viewers who asked questions. Oh, I now see that Sava Vojnovic also has a question. Sava? Yes, thank you. Okay, so before saying goodbye, you have your five or six minutes. Thanks. I'll be brief. Thank you, Professor Tamanaka, for a wonderful lecture. Uh, you've 
offered us a lot, you've covered a lot, so I'll try to uh, focus on a few topics within it. Um, first of all, I would like to hear your take on something that we could perhaps call um, the strong naturalism within legal theory. And I, I mean by that uh, the, the role of natural sciences and their insights into our uh, understanding of law. I would like to hear what you think, how uh, much, for example, biology or natural sciences could help us in understanding what law is and how we perceive it. That's, that's one brief question. And the second is like a follow up on uh, what Professor Miodrak mentioned and uh, commented. Uh, if I recall correctly, in some of your papers uh, and books, you claim that uh, there is no, or you agree with the view that uh, no society is without law. Um, and it somehow seems conflicting to me uh, to claim that on one hand, we should um, rely on folk concepts or what the society itself says about law or how people perceive it within a context. Um, and claiming that uh, uh, even though chieftains and the early societies uh, did not perceive law or, or, or their conduct or uh, um, uh, social relations as something which is connected to law, didn't have the concept of law as we have it today, uh, wouldn't it be uh, somehow contradictory to say that from our perspective, from what we now perceive as law, uh, we projected to the societies who didn't see it as law, just because there are some common elements which we, as Professor Miedrag mentioned, uh, uh, see uh, in, in all contexts related to, to human conduct and so on. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, good. That second question is very important. On the first one, I don't have a question. I don't have much to say, except that I think we have only begun to tap into the implications of naturalism, that is biological information about human behavior for the purposes of law. Uh, so it's hard for me to say where this will go, but my vision, my view is I think it can potentially affect all kinds of things, both theoretically, like how do le why do legal systems emerge, but also currently in terms of criminal responsibility in ways that I suggested. I think all of those are really open to be examined because we haven't done a lot of it so far, although you, we're beginning to see different uh, forms of discussion along these lines emerging. Um, now, I want to address your second question because it's a, it's a very important question about conventionalism and how this plays into what you identify. That is, how does it work with societies when we talk about societies that didn't conventionally recognize what we call law? So basically, the idea of conventionalism is that law is whatever people within society collectively recognized as law. Now, this applies both to any given society, but also to societies over time, societies uh, back as far as, um, and I can, I only know about the Western legal tradition, so I'm excluding anything else in what I say, because I don't know much about the rest of it. But I will say that societies in the Western legal tradition have rec conventionally recognized law going back to Greek times and earlier, and it's quite easy uh, to identify um, so we've already translated terms for law from Greek to Roman to all the European languages, and these have been done for 2000 years. So none of this is new right now. So what I mean by that is now let me go specifically to what you said. So we, we look at what has been conventionally recognized as law within Western societies for the last 2000 plus years, and we see certain patterns in terms of what's been recognized. So one I describe as fundamental rules of social interaction, property rights, protecting uh, individual person or property agreements, marriage and so forth. We also see a form of law recognized over the last several thousand years, and that is uh, the law of the ruling polity, governments. Governments create law, they impose law. Uh, and then we also see recognition of religious law, customary law, international law. So I'm saying these are all forms of law that we have come to recognize in the last 2000 years. Now, let me answer specifically your question. When I go back and look in studies by anthropologists and archeologists about hunter gatherers, for example, I don't know what hunter gatherers called, even if they had a concept of law for their property rights and marital rights, I suspect they didn't. It was just the forms of existence that they lived within. What I'm saying for those groups is that's 
that's law from the standpoint of things that we have recognized over time as something that's been addressed in legal terms. And that in those particular contexts, that is not ones based on translation. In those contexts, we are applying our concepts of law to understand their society. And basically because we have no alternative, there's no other way to do it. We're either gonna say that their social arrangements are completely irrelevant to us, or we're going to have to look at their social arrangements in terms of what we understand these things to be. The key for me is just simply being careful about what you're saying. And I say in the realistic theory book, when I say hunt early hunter-gatherers had property law, I'm not saying they saw it as property law. I'm saying the protections that they gave about use of property, common about uh, uh, restrictions on use of property, those look very much like what we can today and have for the last 2,000 years viewed as property rights. Uh, so yes, you are very right to be alert to this issue, and I've described a way in which I think we can deal with it consistently. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, since we don't have any more questions, I will just again like to say thank you a lot for coming to Belgrade Legal Theory Group meeting. Um, we hope so that uh, in some future years, maybe we will repeat this um, kind of lecture uh, and I will just like to say again that next meeting is on 16th of November. Uh, we are hosting Alessio Sardo from University of Genova and as you said we have um, Postema's lecture on nature value and val uh, valuability of the rule of law on the uh, 31st of October. So again thank you very much and see you in a week. Thank you. Thank you. Reživelas. Ugasi snimanje. Da, čekaj. Bili ste odlični. Hvala, hvala. hvala.